All righty. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar with Ricky. Um, before we get started, let's just wait a couple more minutes for people to trickle in. But as we're waiting, um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box on your right side. Uh, maybe introduce your name, where are you from, where are you based, um, what time is it in your area, um, what is your role in um, the maintenance and reliability industry. We'd love to get to know you more. Um, Ricky would love to get to know you. So yeah, feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourselves as we wait for um, another minute or so. Okay. Awesome. We have somebody from Ohio. Very cool. I see quite a few people typing. Awesome. Hi, Hector from Chile. Awesome, we have a friend from Toronto, another one from Mexico. Awesome, it's really nice to meet you guys. Awesome, we have Duke from Nigeria. Wow, we got people from all over the world, that's awesome. Cool, so it's 3.02, let's get started here. Awesome, so welcome everyone. My name is Chelsea, I'm a community admin in the maintenance community Slack group. Um, we are a community of over 4,000 maintenance and reliability professionals and we are only growing. Um, we hold a ton of discussions, we host live webinars like this one, um, we share a ton of resources, we give away thousands of dollars worth of prizes um, and so much more. So please join us if you aren't already in this free community. Um, also, I wanted to make a very special announcement. Um, the maintenance community will be hosting an Ask Me Anything session, which is a virtual question and answer session with a maintenance expert. Um, the event will be hosted tomorrow at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time in the maintenance community Slack group. And the maintenance expert who will be there to answer all of your maintenance and reliability questions um, is none other than George Williams, CEO of Reliability X. Um, during this event, we will be also giving away a Udemy course um, to one lucky person who asks a question. Uh, so you don't want to miss this great opportunity and this great event. And yeah, so with that, I would love to introduce today's speaker. We have Ricky Smith back again to talk about attributes of a highly effective CMMS. Um, before I pass the mic to him, I wanted to go over some important housekeeping. So we are recording this webinar and the recording will be available and on demand as soon as we end our session. You will all be receiving an email with the link to access the webinar. Um, also at the end of the presentation, if we have some time, Ricky will answer some questions that you might have. So at the right side of your screen, there's a chat box and in that chat, you can submit any questions that you might have throughout the webinar. And Ricky will try to go over as many questions as he can at the very end. Um, so yeah, with that, I think I covered everything. So I'll hand it over to Ricky to kick us off. All right, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Attributes of a highly effective CMS. Huh, let's find out what it's all about. So questions for the participants, okay? So text in your answers, okay? How easy is it to write a work order in your current CMMS or EAM and assign it to a specific asset. In other words, can you? Is it easy for you to write a work order and then make sure that 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 work order is assigned to the specific asset you're working on? The easy, difficult. We do not charge a work order to a specific asset number, and we do not write work orders, and we do not use the CMMS. There you go. So answer that one first. Let's see what you got. We got easy, easy, very easy. 
We use CMMS, easy using SAP. Wow, easy to use SAP. Wow, that's great. Is that it? Yep, I think so. Oh, we got another easy. Right. Question two. How difficult is it to retrieve equipment history on a specific asset? Simple, cannot retrieve history on a specific asset. A little cumbersome, but however it can be retrieved. So just three answers. Awesome, we got some people typing. Not a simple task. C, little cumbersome. Well, we got another C. Um, however, can be done when needed. Um, we got a not that easy. All right, I don't hear any more clicks. Yeah. All right, number three. Do you use handheld PDAs or cell phone to manage or find information for your CMMS? Or like write work orders on? Yes or no? We got a no <laughs> straight off the bat. <laughs> oh, Hector said yes. We got another no. Marty said not That's currently. Big, I know Hector's doing it. I know that. <laughs> We got another no. Yeah, it seems like we're getting a lot of no's here. Someone said tablets are available. However, trades yeah. don't want to use those tablets. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So how does your organization use a maintenance dashboard which provides everyone with the information? How current are the, these so when your organization has a dashboard, does it have a maintenance dashboard, something like this? Yes or no? We got some people typing. Not yet. Yes, no. Another no. Oh, we got a yes. Good. There's some proactive people out there. Probably Hector. <laughs> You're All right. right. All right. So just yes or no. Okay. Let's move on. To attribute Webster dictionary of specification or characteristic described to something. Anytime somebody gives me a word or like attribute, I, I got to spell, I got to look up the definition to make sure I um, identify it properly. So let's just say, if you had a magic wand, what would you want from your CMMS? Would you want it user friendly? You know, using the KISS method, you know, keep it simple, stupid, you know, accurate maintenance dashboard scorecards, you know, required data field entry, automated, you know, failure reporting based on maintenance rework, MTBF or critical assets. You know, this automated failure reporting is a big deal. So it, it helps reliability engineers know specifically where they can target their issues that they're having. Maintenance technicians, reliability engineers, or maintenance supervisors use of PDAs or cell phones with barcoding ability ability to use equip to review equipment history on specific assets real time. I mean, perfect way to do that. <clears throat> and actual maintenance labor costs, labor hours posted on work orders before closure. You know, we want actual labor hours posted. You know, for all on all work order before closure, we want to make sure that it is put into the system. Work order closeout requirements we need to have, right? And an algorithm, uh, the last one, the algorithm to assist maintenance scheduling based on asset criticality and defect severity. So, what would your magic wand be? Some of you were typing, so I know you you tap you text something in. What was it? Now, do you see anything on the text? Uh, someone's typing right now. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm sorry, but they sold out. Amazon sold out a magic wand, so I'm not sure if they'll have them back <laughs> again. Okay. <laughs> Someone said, I'm being greedy, need it all. Okay, okay. And then a lot. Someone said simple and utilized by everyone. Marty said all of the above. Um, somebody said easy and simple. 
I like simple. Um, Hector said more interaction with cloud for some key metrics. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's move on. So, what is a CMMS attribute? So, when we talk about the attributes of specification, you know, or characteristic ascribed to something, a CMMS, also known as a, you know, computerized maintenance management information system is a software, this is an attribute, a software program that maintains a computer database of asset reliability information used to manage a maintenance organization successfully. A few attributes of effective CMMS, equipment hierarchy is set up with a parent, child, grandchild, et cetera, according to ISO 14224. Equipment hierarchy is set up, so like equipment. So things like you know, electric motors. So between this horsepower and this horse, horsepower, I can dive into history and find out are we having problems on specific assets in the CMMS or maybe one, let's talk about motors. Okay, electric motors. So let's say I've got a 50 to 100 horsepower motors. Okay, are they all having the same problem or not? I should be able to click in the CMMS and find that information very quickly. All parts are charged to, this, to a specific, to your specific CMMS. There's no option about, you know, parts being charged. And the CMMS, when I say to a to specific CMMS, it's also to a specific asset, okay? All maintenance work is charged to a work order. Oh, here it is. Which is assigned to a specific asset to ensure equipment history is accurate, resulting in the right decisions made at the right time. All right. So here's the bluff. You know, the... Anybody know what the bluff is? Text it in if you know what a bluff is. You got a yes. I don't know what, what it is. What does it stand for? What does bluff stand for? Marty, with the question mark, said ROI. Hector doesn't know. Um, Hector doesn't know. He, Okay, I'll tell you what the bluff is, okay? Bluff is the bottom line up front, okay? So, bottom line up front, cost to manage through a proactive, continuous approach to manage and maintenance, you know? So, we look at work identification. Where does work come from? Work comes from preventive maintenance, operator care, PDM, but also work requests. And then planning, maintenance scheduling, Schedule by day, by hour, work execution to specification, using repeatable procedures, work order closeout, you know, making sure that all work orders are closed out effectively. Let me ask this question to the group. Who closes out your work orders? What's what's the title of the person that closes out your work orders? Does the technician close them? Does the planner? Does the supervisor? Who's the last one to look at it before it goes into CMMS? We got supervisors, maintenance supervisor. Mom said, I do it currently, and he's a maintenance manager. Um, we got maintenance planner, maintenance manager, planner, supervisor, manager. Okay. The planner should be the one. The supervisor has to review them. I mean, when I was a maintenance supervisor, I was the last one to look at it before I turned it over to the, to the, uh, the maintenance planner. But the maintenance planner is, is the only one sitting, hopefully, calm in their office and not getting a lot of phone calls or you know text messages and all this kind of stuff. So if the planner is the one that closes out, they can look at it and make sure the right codes are closed out in the CMMS to give us the right information. And then our you know our breakdowns, failure reporting, analysis, and corrective action system. Stockholders and, and owners, they want a return on investment. You know, they want money, you know, and that's part of that bottom line up front. I mean, they want to know, you know, what am I gonna get from this? If we look at typical, okay, so maintenance costs is a replacement of asset value, 3.5 to, to 9%. World class is 2 to 3%. So typical is three costs, three we spend three times more money on maintenance costs than we do in world class. The CMMS system, if you go to the ones that are really bad and the costs are very high, they don't use the CMMS, the full functionality of the CMMS. I can tell you that. This world class, 100% of them I've been to that, that are really good, all of them 
use the CMMS fully functional. So what is not a CMMS attribute? So soft, software package used to identify, you know, whether maintenance techs are working or not. I, I you know, when I was super, I didn't, I mean, my techs knew to work. I didn't need to watch them, but I have seen some maintenance leaders that, that want to watch certain people. If I got people I got to watch, I probably need them to go find a job work for my competition. Okay. Software package was not a CMMS attribute. A software package used the right work orders, which are not charged a specific asset. Otherwise, we got a blanket work order. We got a blanket work order. So all work is covered by a work order. Okay, got it. Software package used by technicians to enter their time to a call center. You know, 98% plus of all work must be charged to a specific asset number. Software package where the bad maintenance data is input. You know, you put bad data in, you get bad data out. Maintenance work order closeout data input is not controlled through a RACI chart like you see here on the right to identify roles and responsibilities. How do we, when we write a work order, we close them out? Who is responsible? And this is a good question. So is bad data input happening at your site? True or false? Uh, true, very true. Got some more people typing. Another true. All the time. <laughs> so if you look at the, the RACI chart, if you were to find define roles and responsibilities for the work data, then I think you're going to find that it, things work a lot better. So let's look at this one. It, so you look at the top, you got the position, you know, the arrow goes over to the top on horizontal, the tasks are down vertically. A is accountable. So like write a work request, there's one, only one A for each task, okay? So accountable means your buck stops here, okay? That came from when I was at the Pentagon on an investigation that uh, I learned this in the, my Lean Six Sigma group. I, I never used it before, but since then, man, it's changed my life. So write a work request, accountable is maintenance manager. Who writes the work request? Maintenance supervisor, maintenance tech, maintenance planner, could be an operator, okay? So if we look, down the task, okay, position. So this one we just talked about, convert to a work order. So we get a work request converted to a work order. Who does that? So again, accountable is the maintenance manager. The maintenance supervisor may convert it to a work order or the planner can do that. Work order charged to an asset, a little bit, a little bit different here, work order charged to an asset. See, the technician could do it, but it's say it's consulted. So we want to make sure the work orders are charged specifically to an asset. Maintenance planning, you know, again, accountable maintenance manager. This time the maintenance planner is doing it. Scheduling, same thing. Work execution, work order, data input. Here you go. A, accountable maintenance manager. Who, who puts the data input? Maintenance tech and maintenance planner. Work order closeout. It's only one. And that is the maintenance planner. Maintenance KPI is a maintenance planner. So how did how how did you like this? You think do you think this um using a racy chart will help you, you know, be able to use your CMMS better? I think it should be an attribute attribute of CMMS. I think it ought to be a requirement. We got a yes. And you got some other people type in. Another yes. Another yes. <laughs> okay, so we, we see that most people say yes. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So some CMMS attributes. I know you've been waiting on this. I've been kind of holding it back, you know, but now you, you're going to get it, okay? So an attribute, equipment hierarchy. We're in ISO 14224, we got to be vertical in the hierarchy and horizontal. That way we capture all our equipment, all our costs, all our failure history, and so on. So equipment history, important. That's why work order closeout is so critical. If we don't close out the right data, 
we won't have good history. Vendor information, absolutely. If, we, if we've got vendors that are doing maintenance work, or well, we got vendors buy, selling this stuff, it needs to be in the CMMS. KPIs, absolutely. We want those key performance indicators. The dashboards, I like dashboards, not, not just one overall for maintenance, but also down to the specific category, like a maintenance technician dashboard, you know, a planner's dashboard, you know, maintenance manager dashboard. That way they can see what they have control over and how effective it is. Because if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Planning, scheduling, we, we know that. PM module, you know, a lot of companies, you know, to have SAP, have the PM module. It, but also it's plant maintenance modules, what it stands for. But I like a PM module by itself. It focuses on preventive maintenance too. Inventory management, big deal. All inventory that's in storeroom, all the inventory, the parts, must be tagged to assets, must be tagged to assets. You know, otherwise, how do you know what you what what asset this part goes to? And I've seen companies that don't do that. They don't tag any of them. Technicians, so we want the technician in there, okay? Work orders and then failure reporting. So why a CMMS may not be effective? You know, no one understands the true value of the CMMS. I've seen that too many times, you know. We don't we don't need that CMMS. I mean, we, things are going well without it. Right. Okay. Lack of accurate data results in bad decision making. Work order data is not captured. Inconsistency in management of all assets results in high maintenance costs. Again, a lack of accurate data can result in ineffective decision making by management. Implementation was not effective because the customer is the expert. I don't have many. Oh my gosh, I've been involved in so many CMMS implementations, and it's kind of surprising how the customer is the one that knows everything about the CMMS, but they never had a CMMS before. You know, I know I don't want them to do that. I want them to do this. <laughs> right, right. Don't call me when you got a problem with it. Okay. Customer did not ask about the value proposition. So what is the value proposition? How much money can I save if I've got a if I've got a fully integrated maintenance software? Well, it's kind of hard to say because it's kind of squishy, but I can tell you one thing. For a fact, if you don't have a fully functional CMMS set up correctly, you know, you're going to be losing a lot of money because you're going to be reactive a lot. You can be making bad decisions based on bad data. So this difference of the value proposition, the difference between current state and future state, managing with accurate data. The organization, you know, cannot manage what they cannot measure effectively and efficiently. So why a fully functional CMMS is not an option. Accurate data is the only method to manage assets effectively and efficiently in order to optimize costs and optimize asset reliability. So Mount Holly was the benchmark. This is, was the first fully integrated CMMS in the world. This is one of the places I started my career. And you see Mount Holly and you see typical, this is Alcoa Mount Holly. You see plan schedule. Okay. so. Plan schedule, what really they were using the term plan schedule, but it was schedule compliance was 91.5%. Typical was 30 to 50%. Breakdowns in labor hours, 1.8%, and then 15.50% for typical. Now, understand, I've had people tell me, what the, yeah, your labor hours are so low because you probably got a lot more technicians than normal. This plant had a fourth, one fourth, 25% of what a typical smelter had that size. You know, in in technicians, we had a small amount of technicians. All of them were highly trained. We had procedures. We did everything to specification, and we had the CMS to tell us what's going on. Inventory level, well, whatever you know. So normal, whatever normal is. Well, Mount Holly was about half of that, and in fact, it was more than that. See, so backlog five point five weeks. So one week of backlog, if you got ten maintenance people working forty hours a week you know, is 400 labor hours. So that's one week of backlog, 5.5 weeks. You multiply 5.5 times that, that number. All right, budget performance, John looked at the money. You know, the variance, one to 3%, you know, he always watched the money. In charge of maintenance and engineering, he's watching the money. Doesn't mean he cuts the money. He means what he does is he adjusts the dial. In other words, people, you know, when things aren't quite working right, but he knows who to go to. Capital replacement is low. 
you know, typically is high. Here's my GTO. Not not mine. I wish it was. But, you know, it, if this GTO was maintained, this is what it looks like. And it would drive. This is what equipment is all about. I wouldn't want to go buy a GTO like that today. You know, if I would maintain it, it it'd still be fully functional like our equipment is. Capital replacement is low. Stockouts, in other words, you go to the store and the part's supposed to be there, it's not there. Okay. Minor, Mount Holly, routine, typical. So what do you, why do you need, what do you really need from a CMMS? User friendly. You know, when it needs to be, you know, using the KISS method, you know, just keep it simple, you know, and uh, method. So it needs to be user friendly because people don't want to use something that is difficult. Manage maintenance with process maps, which are aligned with your CMMS. You know, here's a couple of process maps. One's the maintenance continuous improvement loop. You know, starts with the PM, PDM, maintenance planning, and so on. And then the maintenance scheduling process map. So you take the high level, then you break it down to the lower level. Maintenance dashboards and scorecards, you know, are used to manage asset reliability. You know, I showed you a scorecard earlier. So PM compliance, if you got a scorecard that people know the score in the game, and they know how hard they need to work in order to achieve what we need, our goals. What are they? What are they? So here we got PM compliance at 94%, but schedule compliance is only 32%. Breaks to the schedules 15. I don't know if that's good or bad. Bill I mean technicians, yeah. MTBF of critical assets. I think it's important to measure mean time between failure of critical assets. However, if we don't put the failure data in our CMMS, then we can't do that. So that's why this data is critical. Maintenance rework, things that we go back and we have to do it again. There's the SMRP called maintenance rework. If you remember SMRP, look it up and use it. I'll tell you, it can help you a lot. If not, send me an email and I'll be glad to share some information with you on it. Stockouts, we talked about in an OEE. All this data hits OEE and it provides discipline, to a chaotic maintenance organization. That's why we need a, a real good, a, effective CMMS, okay? So CMMS requirements, not an option. Required data field entry. Asset number at, you know, asset number at the lowest level. So we went to hierarchy set at the lowest level. Accurate maintenance labor hours posted for work orders up before closure. Work order closeout requirements. What do, do I require in the work order when we close it out? Algorithm. You know, to assist in decision making based on asset criticality and defect severity. A lot of this is used in planning and scheduling, especially in the scheduling part of it. At least I, I've used it, you know. So we got criticality, we got defect severity. Here we got criticality, say ranking in this from not to high, okay. Severity, okay. So if the, the severity is higher, like a one, I mean lower, like a one. One severity is very high. So if we look at the order which we will process these work orders, the, the schedule, if the criticality is high, defect severity is high, means it's going to fail soon, then that's the first one that I'm going to schedule, and second one, and third one, and so on. How many of you have seen an algorithm like this before? We got some people typing. Oh, we got a we got no, a lot of no's. Yeah, that's something upkeep. I've been talking to Ryan about you know doing this in the CMMS because very few companies in the world actually have this. They used to have them, but they don't anymore. They use an Excel spreadsheet or Access to do it. Okay, so automated failure reporting based on bad actors. You know, maintenance. Rework MTBF and critical assets like we talked about earlier. Maintenance technicians, reliability engineers, and maintenance supervisors. Use of PDAs or cell phones with barcoding capability and to review equipment history on specific assets real time. Think about this. If you go out to a problem on a piece of equipment, you're troubleshooting. It'd be nice if all the equipment was barcoded and you had a handheld, you know, you could have a tablet or you could have a cell phone. You just scan that barcode. And bring up the equipment history and you can you can find the equipment history. It'd be better to have a tablet if you're gonna look for equipment history. Okay. But it, if it's in there correctly, it should not be hard to find for that specific asset. The maintenance planner closes all work orders. The maintenance supervisor reviews the work orders, but all maintenance work orders, you know, closed by the maintenance planner. It's the only one sitting calm. 
you guys are how many of you are meeting a supervisor tell me if you're just say yes if you're meeting a supervisor i just make make sure i don't say something bad okay no i'm just kidding how many i heard one we got a yes we got another yes Ahmed said used to be. We got another yes. So we got a lot of we got a lot of supervisors. So think about this. You know, it at the end of the day, we end of the shift, end of your shift, sometimes it gets a little chaotic. So for you to close out the work orders, a lot of times you may, you know, not close them out exactly the way they should be. That's why I want to make the supervisor to review it and make any changes necessary. But then the planner is the last one sitting calm in the office. You know, they're the ones sitting calm in the office that can look at it and say, nope, that's not right. Okay, make the, make the change to it. No big deal. Could it make, how do you know? How do you know if your planner is, is proactive enough to handle this? Okay. Call them on the phone when you go back and say, hey, I need a I need a part right now. You know, I've got a breakdown. I need a part right now. The next thing they should hear is the dial tone. Because planner works next week, future work, not not today's work. That's the maintenance supervisor job. So top seven attributes of of an ineffective CMS organization to understand what maintenance best practices look like. How do you, how are you going to understand the CMS if you don't even know what maintenance best practices look like? It makes it very difficult. Implementation oversold and under delivered. Oh, my God. Um, I'm sorry, the one with SAP. I'm sure you got it working well, but most of the SAPs that I've that I came upon after they were implemented was was oversold and underdelivered. And a lot of software companies I've seen that too. Not just SAP, but the other ones. The needs of the customer did not match what was delivered. That's why if you got a new CMMS coming in, coming in, I would put your best maintenance technician, you know, with that vendor, and I'd put a couple other people like a reliability engineer on that team also and whoever else you need if you're going to line if you're going to line with operator care then you probably need to put an operator a good operator on there users do not use the cmms as design you know no doubt no process maps to align you know in order to align the cmms how many of you have process maps oh no no don't don't, don't type that in how many of you don't have maintenance process maps Type it in for me. Awful quiet. We got someone typing, don't have it. Got some more people typing. We got planning to have one. Good. Hector said we do have. Looks like that might be it. Okay. Process maps are important. That way we all can do so planning, scheduling, work execution. Everything can be done to specifications. Could we have a process map step by step? How do we do it? I recommend that you that you push from a management perspective, if, you get, if you're in a management position, make some recommendations on it. Maintenance dashboards do not provide a drill down. In other words, you got that high level dashboard like I'm showing you, maintenance dashboard. You should be able to click on it and drill down and find out where the data is coming from. So you can, so you can match it up to exactly what are we having problems with. So if one of your KPIs like PM compliance is not working well, drill down and find out maybe schedule compliance is out of whack or something. Something's going on. Equipment hierarchy is not structured to meet the cup meet the customer's needs, the customer be in production vertically and horizontally. You know, I mean, using this ISO data, you know, you gotta know how to use ISO fourteen two two four, but it's it's not difficult, not difficult. So guiding principles of an effective CMMS, all users, a user's manual is provided to all users with focus on meeting the requirements and maintenance best practices and providing definition of terms and words and also should have the process maps in there. Maintenance process maps are available. There you go. Work identification, the failure reporting. Maintenance dashboards are used to assure alignment of all maintenance processes. 
So guiding principles, what the guiding principle is, is how do we stay within a certain range on what we're doing? That's all I'm saying here. That's what a guiding principle is. So all maintenance work performed with a maintenance work order and 98% plus are charged to an asset. Paperless systems, you know, through, it should be through handheld PDAs, smart cell phone, CMMS data entry accuracy is a requirement. Now, so implementation, re-implementation. How many of you ever did a re-implementation of a CMMS? Anybody? So everybody, so management says, man, I'm tired of this thing. We got we to turn it around. So we're going to go in and we're going we're gonna to re-implement the CMMS the right way. Anybody been involved in one of those before? You got no, nope, no, <laughs> lots of no's. Darn, let's open here how it happens. <laughs> yeah, we keep getting no's here. <laughs> okay. So some recommendation for re-implementation. Educate. So if you if your CMMS is not functioning properly right now, first thing you got you need to do is, is educate plant leadership and maintenance best practices. It's a perfect time for change. And you got to put put together the value proposition. How much so why do I need why me as a plant manager? Do, I, do we need to turn this thing upside down and, and re-implement the CMMS? You know, well, maybe the value proposition is, you know, we went through these, you know, look at, look at this. I mean, there's a lot of things. This is all about the money. This is all about the money. We can make an impact on the cost in an organization and reliability and, they, and even bring the cost per unit produced down. Educate the, the maintenance team and proactive maintenance. Paint the picture of proactive maintenance. What does it look like? Share the difference in cost between world-class versus typical maintenance organization. You know, where do you want to be? That's what, that's what I always say. Where do you want to be? Create process maps. Every process map should have a racy chart. That way we clearly have defined roles and responsibilities for everybody. Create leading and lagging dashboards. Test implementation 14 days and adjust as needed. You know, so once you re-implement, you need to run a test for 14 days before you switch over and then adjust as needed. Okay. So issues that you may experience when moving forward in this currently is currently not in a maintainable level. You cannot perform preventive maintenance on equipment that continues to break down. You need to bring equipment to a maintainable level. Now, one thing you may do. And this is what I had to do. You, you may take it one asset or, or one area and identify all the problems and the equipment there and then write work orders, plan and schedule and restore it and then maintain it at that level. And then move to the next set of equipment and so on. You may not have the money to implement 100 percent. You may need to implement in one area. Prove the concept, the POC, prove the concept of proactive, you know, use of CMMS in one area. And it couldn't be a simple, it could be like the storeroom, okay? I prefer planning and scheduling, but that's just me, okay? Leadership not educated, again, back in best practices, they they need training of four hours, you know? So they need to be the bottom line up front. Management wants to fragment, to fragment implementation. Explain future state based on known best practices. That's why they got to know what best practices is. And unsure of meeting expectations through experimentation. Experimentation will kill us, you know? We don't want to experiment. We want to go in and we want to implement correctly. So my recommendation to CMMS users, listen to the software vendor or what is working with other companies. They know. They've been working with other companies. Listen to them. Training on the CMMS is critical to success. Do not shortcut this process. Do not shortcut it. A lot of companies do. Ensure all personnel who may use or manage the CMMS have been trained and task qualified in use of the CMMS. Process maps, absolutely a requirement. Do not shortcut recommendations for the CMMS vendor, you know, for implementation. Know what a fully functional CMMS looks like. We've got to know what good looks like. Ask the CMMS company to create <clears throat> your dashboard, your KPI dashboard. If you, if you switch it to a new CMMS, why not put it in? It's not going to cost much. Believe me, it's not much. But I want to, we got these big TV screens and a lot of plants. Most plants, we got them. Why don't we put the maintenance dashboard up there for everybody sees all the technicians? Put it in the maintenance shop. 
You know, for the maintenance technicians to see, the maintenance supervisor, the maintenance manager, know how things are going. Create a master plan for implementation with milestones and the five roles and responsibilities. So, you know, in fact, really, to create the master plan, you really need to do a gap assessment of where you are and where you need to be and create the master plan to close that gap. I'm working on one right now with an organization. You know, if a step in a process is skipped or performed at a substandard level, it creates defects known as failures, which is absolutely what we're talking about. All right. So what one thing you learned today? Text it in. Or maybe you already knew it. You just it just came back up and your and your to your attention. <laughs> we got some people typing. Might take a little bit. No problem. We got time. <laughs> I got one hour until I start my next class. <laughs> Marty <Malaysia>. says, Oh, <laughs> Marty says um, he learned how important it is to process, process map. Yeah. Very um, critical. Amit said, yeah, Amit said CMMS should be very simple. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excuse me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, but Dill said RACI is a critical component of a successful CMMS. Yeah. Um, another person one. said, mm -hmm. "Another person said CMMS friendly KISS method and implementation." Yeah, yeah. Test it. Prove the concept before it works. Before you, you know, why? Why don't let the vendor go home until you until it's working right? Sorry, you're not going home today. I called. I called the gate guard. He's not letting you out. <laughs> Um, we got a few more. Uh, Hector says revisiting RACI from time to time to ensure workflows are smooth and effective to current operational context. Good, good. Yeah, another person said how to identify effective and efficient CMMS base, um, based on their attributes. Yeah. And okay. I think the last response was written procedures will help to reinforce responsibilities and decision making process. I knew there would be one person out there to say that. Good. Thank you for saying mm -hmm. that. All right. So any questions or comments? Here's my list of, of training classes coming up, workshops. They'll be via Zoom. So I'll be able to see you. You see me in those workshops. They'll also be live. So I'm having them live at a, at a local university. All right. So what's your questions or comments? Awesome. As we kind of wait for people to send in their questions or comments live, I did see one question that came through while you were speaking. Um, it says here, is the RACI chart a suggestion or best practice? Best practice. Absolutely. Best practice. That's why when I did the investigation at Walter Reed Medical Center for the U.S. Army, one of the things they require is making sure that once you finish changing a process, which we did, identify the problem, change the process, was they, they need to have a race. So everybody now clearly understands how to use it. Cool. And then we got another question here. Um, how much data is required to create a CMMS? How much data is required? For one, you gotta you need to walk the equipment. You gotta put all the equipment, all your assets in the CMMS. You need to have everything that's in your storeroom in the CMMS and assigned to specific those assets that you have in the CMMS. You need to have a structure of the hierarchy in there. So you got the the, the child, the grand or the grandchild, the child, the parent, and so on. You know, so that way all your data rolls up and it rolls down. So it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But make sure you get a good person to help you with it. And there's a lot of smart people out there who knows how to do it. Cool. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I know it, but it's too much detail for me on that. You know, because you want to do it right the first time. But there's some great people out there. Awesome. Another question here are what are some signs or clear signs that an organization should adopt a CMMS? 
Well, if you if you're maintaining equipment, you need to, you need to adopt the CMMS. Is that is that the right? Is that what the question was? Um, I think it was just more like uh, maybe for smaller organizations, um, what are some of like the clear signs that they might need a CMMS? Because I know for larger organizations, it's really important since they're handling so many different assets and data. Um, but what about for like smaller businesses? You know, any anyone, any organization that has assets, you know, it's, it, it's really important to have, you know, a CMMS because you want to manage the, the assets. Could uh, be honest with you. There's a lot of money wasted, you know, by not managing our assets, you know, effectively. So not having a CMMS is, is like driving, you know, a car without a GPS, you know, across the U.S. or across Mexico, wherever you get lost, you know, you can end up in the wrong place. CMMS keeps you on track and it makes sure that the money you spend, organization spends, is spent in the right way. Awesome. Um, we got another question here. How can we improve um, and maintain responsibilities when it comes to implementation in the organization, CMMS implementation. The RACI chart. <laughs> Set everybody down. Go through the RACI process. I've got I've, I've got the steps. If you need if you need some information on what the steps are to, to take someone through the RACI you know process, I'd be glad to share it with you. Just send me an email. Awesome. We have another question here. Um, I believe he's asking, um, how can we convince management to get on board to implementing a CMMS in the organization? Um, he also asked, what is like the return of investment on a CMMS? The return on investment. That's a good one. Um, it used to, um, when, it's hard to connect the CMMS directly to it. But understand, if you've got a bank account, and you don't manage your money in that bank account or you're investing money. And that's what they are with, with maintenance. They're investing money. If we don't know what we invest in our money in, then we're probably not going to get the results. The best thing to do to educate them is get them in one of these webinars on maintenance best practices that we're talking about. Just ask them to sit in one of them. Or I got toolbox talks too on, on different topics like this that can help you. But to ask them to you get the replay, it, you know, so if they sign up, then they can come back and listen to it again. I think until they're aware that they need that knowledge, they need that process, they're not going to do it. And so you got to you got to do it easy. It's like trapping, you know, a rabbit or any other animal. You got to put the bait out to them to get them in the trap. And that's what you got to do here. You know, look at look at you go back to one of my slides. Where I took it at the. Uh, let's see. Hang on one minute. Uh, well, look at this one. You see this maintenance scorecard right here? This is from an actual plant. So these things tell us, are we working well together or not? Okay, so having something like this, you can do this now. You know, start tracking this information. So when management sees this happening, they, they may say, how come things are getting so much better? And say, it's kind of interesting you ask. I, let me show you my maintenance scorecard, you know. And I tell you, it works. It works. This is the SAP one, by the way. And then there's a, okay, here it is right here. Main this cost is a percent of replacement asset value. See the stockholder owners, you know, typical. When you say 3.5 to 9% is typical and 2 to 3% is world-class, that means you're spending an extremely large amount of money. You know, so they can, you, they can get this number, this replacement asset value. All you got to do is get your, if you look at your insured value of the plant and every company has their plant or their organization insured and say, okay, what percentage is my maintenance cost of that asset value? And it should, if it's world-class, if you're doing great, it should be two to 3%. If it's typical, which it, probably, it may even be worse than if 3.5 to 9%, you got to talk to money because that's what matters to them. Okay. I hope I answered your question correctly or like you're looking for. If not, send me an email. We'll, we'll talk more about it. Awesome. I think that's it in terms of questions. And we are currently at the end of our time. If you guys have any other questions, again, um, 
the slide is up with Ricky's contact information. So feel free to contact him through those means, but you could also message him in the Slack community. Um, Ricky is in there. So if your questions weren't addressed now or you have, happen to have a question later on, um, feel free to just message him, email him, um, and yeah, connect with him. Uh, but yeah, again, we're at the end of our time. So thank you so much, uh, Ricky, for just sharing your knowledge and your expertise. And thank you everybody um, for joining in live. Um, Again, you'll be receiving a recording of this webinar shortly in your emails, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and also, if uh, you have time tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time, uh, please join us for the um, event that we will be having, the uh, question, Ask Me Anything session with uh, George Williams from Reliability X. Um, but yeah, with all that being said, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you are at. And thanks again, Ricky. Thank you. Bye. Cool. Bye.